It's great to be with you this evening. Y para los que hablan español, le quiero dar la bienvenida también a ustedes. Es un placer estar aquí entre ustedes, sobre todo en el, en el estado de Texas. John, thank you for that very, very kind introduction. You're absolutely right. I have been involved in faith initiatives, and I'm so delighted as my position in HUD that now it brings me here to you. Also want to commend Dr. Perkins under his leadership. The Christian Community Development Association has grown from 37 founding organizations to more than 500 today, reaching into 32 states and in just 11 years. Amazing. Obviously, America's communities are hungering for the message of Christian compassion that forms the foundation of your work. I'm honored to join you here tonight, and I'm glad for the opportunity to share some thoughts on the President's plan to inspire new acts of charity by embracing the spiritual caretakers of our communities. But before I go any further, I want to recognize Wayne Gordon for the principal leadership that he has brought to CCDA as your President. Wayne, we thank you. Those of us in Washington appreciate your work. I also want to thank Kathy Dudley for her work as the host of this conference of, uh, and as president of the Dallas Leadership Foundation. And I also want you to know that our prayers are with Dr. Bailey. I know he has been a strong voice in the city of Dallas, and I know how much you want to restore back to health, and uh, our prayers are with him so that he can be back to work soon. I also want to thank the Dallas Leadership Foundation uh, host committee. And I also want to acknowledge the many corporate supporters who are helping to make this, po this conference possible. You know, President Bush has called on corporate America to give more and to give better. And I am delighted that they're here with you and supporting you. And finally, I commend all of the members of CCDA as caretakers of our communities who struggle to touch the lives of society's most vulnerable, you each have a special place in my heart, and maybe you'll better understand my passion for your work as I explain to you why that is. See, as a young boy, I lived in Cuba, and by the age of 15, our country had turned into a very troubled place. Religious persecution, Atheistic communism was the rule of the day. Our family, having been raised in the faith and being of strong faith, was not particularly pleased with the situation that was occurring, and life became a little difficult for those of us who would expound our faith. And you know, as we have seen in the last few weeks, uh, the intolerance that can occur where there is no religious freedom you can well understand that things were not good for those of us of faith in Cuba under the communist regime that still reigns there today. So my parents made a very desperate decision, but one that turned out to be a very good decision for me. At the age of 15, they chose to send me away from the country, alone and without them. It wasn't possible for them to leave, but they have found out about a program run by the church where youngsters could come to America and be cared for until they could be reunited with their families. So I was part of that program. It was called Operation Peter Pan, Pedro Pan. And uh, as part of that, I came to Miami and there Catholic Social Services, Catholic Charities took care of me. I was in a camp. I was later in another camp in Jacksonville. And then something that I think is still remarkable to this day happened, which is that one Sunday from a pulpit in church, if uh, a call went out for families who might take into their home these children from another land who did not speak their language and about whom they knew nothing. And one brave family in Orlando, Florida says, by golly, we'll do that. We'll take one of them in our home. And you are people who understand that because you do these acts of compassion each and every day of your lives. But it is an amazing act. And for a more secular world, it's an unbelievable thing for people to do. But they took me into their home and they nurtured me and they loved me and they gave me what I needed most which was the security of a home until I could then four years later be reunited with my parents. But as I did that and as I was welcomed into their home, I began then to live the American dream. I began to understand the opportunities of freedom and all that it has to offer. So I to this day thank my parents for their faith, the faith that passed on to me and for the faith that has 
endure it in my life that helped me through those troubled times while in a loving foster family, but at really in a country alone and scared. And it was that faith that became ever so more personal with our Lord and Savior that really saw me through those difficult times. And in that journey of faith, you know that today I have this tremendous and humbling honor to serve the President of the United States, who is also a person of unwavering faith. At a time when the strength of the world is being tested, Americans have said over and over that having George W. Bush in the White House at this moment is a great comfort. There is no doubt about the source of his inner strength. He is a spiritual man who begins each day in the scriptures and who begins each cabinet meeting with a prayer. He is a compassionate man who grieved openly for the victims of the terrorist attacks. He is a family man who calls his wife the calming influence in his life, a sentiment that I can appreciate because I have been blessed with that same kind of partner in life. My wife, Kitty, has also had a profound influence in my life. I'm not surprised at all that President Bush is reaching out to those with faith in abundance and embracing their work. People like the folks who run the Washington, D.C. soup kitchen that he and I visited just last week. So others might eat some. It's actually more than a soup kitchen. They do provide 800 meals twice a day to the hungry, but they also give them medical care and shelter them, counsel them, treat their addictions, and keep them clothed. As he and I walked through the kitchen where volunteers were making lunch and had the opportunity to talk with them about their work, I thought about a piece of advice uh, St. Francis of Assisi offered. Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. These people preach the gospel every day with their hands and their hearts and with very few words at all. The same compassionate spirit that breathes life into so others might eat has been echoed across the country by the faith community since the September terrorist attacks. Immediately afterwards, you were there to offer physical and spiritual nourishment to the shell shock nation. Two of your members, World Vision and Concerts of Prayer of Greater New York, helped mobilize churches to serve and support those who lost loved ones. Together, they established the American Families Assistance Fund. Donations are helping families meet the immediate cost of funerals, counseling, and other expenses, and the fund will provide for long-term support, too. Last week, volunteers at the Here's Life Inner City Mission prepared Thanksgiving boxes with stuffed with turkey, canned vegetables, beverages, and even pumpkin pie. Those 16,000 boxes went to feed what we call the hidden victims of the war we now find ourselves fighting, like the men and women who lost their jobs cleaning the offices of the World Trade Center or working in its shops and restaurants. Motivated by faith, congregations and community organizations around the country are helping strangers in remarkable ways. You have prompted an outpouring of charity like we have never seen before in America. This did not originate with the federal government. It came directly from the hearts of people like you at the grassroots level, often working through their churches and other houses of worship. Now imagine the number of lives we could change and the impact we could have on this generation and those to come if we could magnify those acts of compassion a hundredfold. This is why President Bush is reaching out to America's faith-based community with a plan built around this dream. The President's plan and the CCDA itself both originated from the simple idea, the belief that our best chance to ease suffering is to tackle it from within by breaking through racial, ethnic, and economic barriers and coming together as neighbors concerned for one another and for the health of our communities. The most creative solutions are found closest to home. The leaders most committed to those solutions to work and put them to work are part of the community and understand the challenge. And let me quote from the president who spoke passionately on this subject in a speech at the University of Notre Dame. 
Compassion often, often works best on a small human scale. It is generally better when a call for help is local and not long distance. It is not a lack of compassion that keeps communities from answering that call. Our cities are overflowing with compassion. The problem is that government is standing in the way. Washington can and must do more to promote new acts of charity in our communities, especially at a time when charity is the only thing some people have to hang on to. On its own, a family in crisis does not stand much chance of being noticed within the gigantic Washington bureaucracy. When government is focused on only the big picture, individual lives can get overlooked. But the federal government's weakness is your strength. Instead of dealing with 281 million lives, the men and women on local level who minister to those in need work right in our neighborhoods on your blocks. Yes, the federal government has a role and a solemn responsibility to meet the needs of the poor in America. When someone in need turns to the government, however, the response is usually faceless. Even though true compassion demands that we take that person's hand and look them in the eye. So our best hope of serving those who have nowhere else to turn is for the federal government to work in partnership with our community caretakers. In January, President Bush created the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives and charged it with the lifting up of the nation's charities, charitable services organizations and encouraging their good works. We need the president's approach because many faith-based and community-based organizations that seek to partner with the federal government feel excluded and discriminated against, and they have been. The roadblocks include outright bias, arbitrary and burdensome regulations, and general confusion over the way the federal government has addressed the separation of church and state. The bigger and better funded organizations have had an easier time because they have lawyers to handle the legal work and staff to manage the paperwork. But these barriers prevent HUD and other federal agencies from expanding our partnerships with America's smaller faith-based groups. For example, there's tremendous confusion when it comes to deciding whether a group is too religious to qualify for federal funding. If HUD decides that a group is too religious, that group will not receive a grant. Unfortunately, the terms that HUD uses to make that decision have never been clearly defined by any court in the land or even by HUD itself. Some groups that deserve funding never get a chance to participate. A faith-based group can improve its chances of receiving a grant if they minimize the role of faith in their work. This is difficult to understand. The very reason so many faith-based groups are successful is the fact that they're tied to their work by their faith. Involvement with HUD, however, has forced groups to water down their message and mask their religious nature, which dilutes the effectiveness and, not, and is not constitutionally required. There have been occasions where groups rooted in the faith wanted to participate in HUD funding until they were told they would qualify for a grant only if they revised their mission statement to edit out references to God. Such demands are heartbreaking and unnecessary. Instead of fearing faith, the government ought to embrace it and encourage the good work of the faith community in our society. <laughs> Local charitable programs should be judged with one central question. Do they work? If they do, if they happen to work in part because they're anchored in faith, then as the president put it, the government ought to say, hallelujah. <laughs> Another problem we found is that HUD has not applied its regulations with a single definable standard. Too often, these inconsistencies result in a case-by-case -case determination, a response that ensures often unfair and always unequal treatment. A decade ago, HUD enacted rules prohibiting the organizations we fund from posting religious symbols like crosses. These rules 
were on the books for less than a year before being repealed and replaced by broader language banning so-called religious influences. Even so, the perception still exists that an organization has to remove all religious symbols from the room when performing government-funded services, even though we would all agree that the presence of a religious symbol has nothing to do with how well an organization performs any given service. But look into the bigger picture. That interpretation goes far beyond anything mandated by our Constitution. Despite good intentions and decades of outreach, the fact remains that in the past, HUD discouraged the active involvement of America's community of faith in lifting up our neighbors. This must change, and under the President's leadership, it will change. The President's faith-based plan is critical, especially now that we're engaged in a war we did not seek. The nation's charities are straining to provide disaster relief at the same time they continue to serve the less fortunate. I am troubled by reports that charitable giving has been on the decline. The President's plan provides a bridge by stimulating giving through tax incentives. It will help eliminate federal discrimination against organizations that provide faith-based work. The President has called on Congress to pass a bill that he can sign into law before Christmas. Now, I believe this would be a wonderful birthday, a Christmas present to the nation. While the legislation is important, my staff is recommending specific steps we can take within HUD immediately to break down the barriers to faith-based groups. I know that we can streamline our regulations and allow you to retain your independence and your religious identity while not running afoul of the constitutional issues of the separation of church and state. The fact that I'm standing here today, a refugee from Cuba, richly blessed by the goodness of strangers, who now serves in the cabinet of an American president is a testament to the power of faith. You know, I have seen for myself the wonderful way in which faith motivates people to open their hearts. I want every child, every man, every woman who reaches out a hand in search of a lifeline to find the same love that carried me into this country as a frightened teenager. You remember, of course, the story of Esther. She became queen of the Persian Empire while just a teenager herself. Her people were scattered, threatened with destruction. Esther was called to risk her life to save them, but she pulled back until her cousin conveyed to her this message. Who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? There is a lesson for us in the story of Esther, one that parallels the situation we find ourselves in today. Our nation has been handed tremendous challenges in the wake of terrorist attacks, but a window of opportunity has been opened to us as well. We know that these difficult events have generated a spiritual reawakening and a new commitment to prayer. We see that Americans are hungry for both spiritual nourishment and a way to reach beyond their own lives to touch the lives of someone else. We can feed that hunger, but it will demand a new way of thinking. This administration is willing to change so that you do not have to. We are committed to tearing down old walls and transforming America. We encourage you to unite with us in this task. There may never be a moment like this again, and I ask you to consider the possibility that God has brought us to this point for this very purpose. This is a new chapter in our history. Let us write it as partners joining together for such a time as this. Thank you very much for having me, and may God continue to bless you and the work that you do. Thank you very much.